Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone, um, and thank you so much for joining us at uh, this fourth seminar um, in our series on the data economy. Um, my name's Abby Adams Prassel, and I'm a professor in the Department um, of Economics here in Oxford, um, and I'm also Associate Head of Department with Responsibility for Research Impact um, and External Engagement. Um, and I am absolutely delighted uh, to welcome uh, Joe Perkins, who is the Senior Vice President and Head of Research at Company lexicon. Um, so at Compass, Joe leads a team of economists and data science data scientists um, to advance Compass's thought leadership um, and develop new methods to analyze complex data uh, with his client work largely residing in um, energy and in digital, uh, hence where he's here today. Um, now, however, Joe was also previously chief economist at the British um, energy regulator Ofgem, um, where he led the delivery of their decarbonisation action plan. Um, and also some analysis behind the setting of the retail, retail energy price cap. And even before this, uh, he was director, a uh, director at the National Audit Office, um, and is also one of our, uh, you know, very successful alumni. So he earned his MPhil in economics from Oxford and was also a prize fellow at All Souls College. Now. Given uh, the cost of living crisis and the kind of phenomenal energy price inflation uh, that we've seen in recent months, um, we're going to have if you like, a slightly different uh, kind of flavour to this talk than what was originally advertised, um, in that Joe is going to be providing um, new insights into the economics of the energy market, given that this market is just kind of in crisis. Um, and um, what you know whilst the scale of the problems that we're seeing right now is much greater than we've seen in the past and this is of course like kind of not a new phenomenon this kind of energy uh, like the issues in the energy sector um so um joe is going to be talking to us about how we reach this position the implications for regulation um and how economics can help and however also draw um on his experience in terms of digital and digital regulation to build a bridge uh, there towards the end of his talk um so with that um i am delighted to hand over to joe um, and i'll be moderating uh, the q a so please um put your uh, questions in the chat throughout um and if they're clarificatory i will stop joe and make sure that we uh, get those uh, kind of sorted out sooner rather than later um, and the more substantive questions um we'll leave to the end um so joe over to you Fantastic. Thank, thanks very much, Abby. Let's just see if this um, I can get the technology to work. Uh, there we go. Yeah. So, so thanks for that. That very lavish introduction. I, I really do feel very honoured and, and happy to be asked to talk here. Um, I know the these talks have been set up around 101 years of economics in Oxford, and that fact caused me to reflect on my time uh, with economics here. And I realise I've been involved in 25 of them first as a student and then as a you know, researcher and then as a, a, a lecturer. Um, that partly makes me feel old, to be honest, but also I guess means I'm, I'm at least a little bit qualified to, to speak here. But I think I should start with a, a couple of apologies. Um, one is that I'm not, not an academic. I have seen a couple of the great presentations in this series on of really interesting academic papers, but that's not really what I'll be doing here. I'll be talking more about some of the wider political economy issues in, in energy markets, some of the economic issues it raises, but it, it won't be quite pushing the boundaries, I must admit, some of those, uh, those presentations have. Um, second, I'm not really going to talk about the economics of data, as, as Abby just um, uh, kind of signalled. I do do some work on digital and data regulation issues, but I also do energy work. And when I was talking this over with, with Alex um, Tatelboy and with Abby beforehand, I said, well, basically, energy is just too interesting now. Why don't you focus on that? So I will mostly focus on the energy side, but I'll bring out a few of those, those wider implications, particularly for digital regulation um, as we get towards the end. So having said what I'm not going to talk about, what am I going to talk about? Um, basically, pretty simply, I'll give some of the context around UK energy prices, also really global energy prices. I think there's obviously lots of headlines about this, lots of talk about this, but I think it is really dramatic when you see how the numbers have developed. I'll then go through the rather mixed history of retail energy in Britain. Um, the cane toads in the title, by the way, will come in there as well. And then I'll try to draw out some of those lessons. So what should we learn for energy markets and, and for other markets as well? So uh, the context, so actually, Gas prices and energy prices in general have fluctuated quite significantly over time. So this shows uh, 
uh, prices between 2009 and the end of 2020. And what you see is that these are gas day ahead prices that um, pence per therm may actually vary over this time between 12 pence, so at the dip uh, right at the start of the COVID um, pandemic, they went as low as 12 pence per therm, up to 87 pence over that time. So that's really quite significant fluctuations in what is a completely central and core commodity. And I'm looking at gas prices here, but in the UK at least, electricity prices are typically driven by gas as well. Gas-fired electricity generators tend to be what's known as a marginal plant on the system. So electricity prices are also, you know, tend to follow the same sort of patterns. So quite big fluctuations over time, but nowhere near as dramatic as we've seen in just the last 18 months. So you saw what was initially a fairly gradual ramp up during 2021 and then a really dramatic increase in autumn winter 2021, which is somewhat moderated over the last couple of months, but it's still, you know, historically, these are very, very high prices. And of course, I don't really need to say this, but I will, energy prices really matter, of course, both directly, and they also feed through to the prices of other goods. Energy is a crucial input in, in so many goods across the economy. And you know, the talk around things like cost of living crises, the talk about high inflation in general, that clearly has lots of elements to it, you know, very simple you know, supply and demand and perhaps overheating of, of economies post pandemic, but energy prices are the single biggest one as, as part of that. And one feature of energy which is worth bearing in mind is that energy is particularly crucial for poorer households. Going back to, I suppose, the Econ 101 of the title of these talks, energy is not a luxury good. So spending does in fact increase with income, but it's much less than proportionately. So poor households pay a much higher proportion of their incomes on energy. Over time that fluctuates of course with energy prices, but you know, this chart shows that the poorest income group will often spend eight to 10% of their income on energy compared to maybe two or 3% for the, the richest income group. So very big differences there. And that I'm afraid, does have potentially very serious consequences. So these are you know, fairly rough estimates around um, what level of excess winter deaths or the winter deaths that you, you, you see each year in the UK fluctuating depending on things like the severity of the, win of the winter, but you, you, know, you do tend to see um, excess deaths each winter in the UK. And what, what proportion of those might be linked to things like cold housing and fuel poverty. And you typically find even in just a standard year without the increase in prices we've seen, that maybe five to 10,000 deaths or even more can be linked to cold housing and some of those to fuel poverty. Now, I should say this is by no means a precise estimate, but it is a, an indicator of the importance of energy prices and perhaps you might say also insulation to, to people's well-being and to health. Um, so I, I think those sorts of impacts on well-being, of course, the overall the most important effects of energy and energy price changes. But there are also, energy price rises also have a strong political impact. There's a pretty strong correlation between price rises and the perceived importance of energy issues. Uh, I tend to think of energy regulators as being a bit like football referees. So no one notices them when, when things are going well, but they can become all too visible when, when things aren't. And I've highlighted just a couple of earlier examples here. So um, back in 2013, there's a lot of political pressure from the Labour opposition around energy prices then. And David Cameron's you know, famous reported comment, at least, about cutting the green crap. So cutting some of the support to environmental programmes, to things like insulation programmes, as a result of um, that pressure, with potentially some reduction in prices in the short term, but maybe long term. Uh, more negative impacts. And more recently, again, after some increases in prices in 2017 and 2018, you had legislation to introduce an energy price cap. And um, that came in January 2019. I'll say much more about that, that one later. What does that mean for the current issues and the current potential crisis? Well, to be frank, your guess is probably as good as mine, maybe better. But I would be very surprised if the policies to date are all that we'll see. Uh, you know, given the, the dramatic increase we've seen over the last 18 months, I, I would expect there to be significantly more to come over, over autumn winter. I think it, it, it is very difficult for any government to um, not to react to what we've seen so far. Um, 
Now, I should say, because I'm going to mostly talk about GB dynamics and some of the policy dynamics here, um, these price rises are really mostly globally driven. They're driven by the overall dynamic between supply and demand at a global level. They're also driven by things like geo geopolitical factors, most obviously recently the war in Ukraine. But of course, GB policy can have an effect, and it is also affected by those overall price rises. So it is useful to, to consider them in the round, I think. But before I do that, I, I did want to digress onto two of my favorite animals, which are sugar cane beetles and, and cane toads. Um, so these, these little beauties here are sugar cane beetles. As the name might suggest, they like eating sugar cane. And, they, um, and because they like eating sugar cane, they reduce the yield of sugar farms, sugar plantations, and the increased costs. So farmers, over time, of course, have been searching for a nice, effective solution. One lovely biological solution, this was um, for farms in um, Northern Australia in particular, was to bring in cane toads, you know, native to South America. The idea was that they would eat the sugar cane beetles, improve yields, nice benefits as a result. And um, back in June 1935, about 100 of these were imported into Australia from Hawaii. Um, and they're, in some sense, they have been very successful. So 100 of them came coming in in 1935. Latest estimates are that there are now more than 200 million of them in Australia. And these have had really profound impacts on ecosystems in, in Northern Australia in particular. Um, they have, in some ways, they have what, what economists might think of as a two-sided market effect. They, they're quite successful predators themselves predators on things like dung beetles, so affecting um, that side of the ecosystem, but they're also poisonous. So actually prey that predators that might want to eat them might die themselves. So they have that, that overall effect. So really profound impacts, as I say, on, on ecosystems that the, that the introduction of cane toads has had. Incidentally, I should say there's no evidence that they've reduced the number of sugar cane beetles. So they've managed to have this profound impacts across the, across the piece but they haven't, as far as we can see, have much impact on sugarcane beetles. And we've got the, the Litchfield Times here, front page headline, they're here. So not necessarily an intervention that's been seen uh, very positively overall. Okay, so why am, I, why am I digressing? What the hell am I doing talking about cane toads? Well, of course, you can think about markets as ecosystems and quite complex ecosystems in, in, indeed in which regulators and other parties are intervening. Um, I, I, as, as mentioned, I do do some work in the digital sector. And the, the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK thinks of mobile phone markets very explicitly as ecosystems. Its recent you know, ongoing study on mobile phones talks about mobile ecosystems. There are a range of players there, from the very small to the very large, including things like app developers, including device manufacturers, operating system firms like, um, like Google and Apple. In energy, similarly, you have the generators of electricity, importers of gas, both domestic generators, so things like solar panels on your roof, but also very large scale wind farms, gas plants, coal plants, whatever. Um, you then have network firms, which are there to transport the energy. And you also then have retail suppliers, the people you actually pay your bills to, and those are a range of different sizes too. And so those ecosystems, just like in the cane toad case, given the complexity of how they operate, interventions there can have unintended consequences that perhaps weren't even imagined when the intervention happened. And I'm going to talk through just some of those dynamics in the GB retail energy case. I should say this is a fairly stylized, fairly high level picture. There's much more detail that was going on um, below this but just trying to bring out some of the key dynamics I see. Um, so first, what happens? So in, where, where would I start this story? In the 1990s, GB was one of the, the kind of countries really pushing privatization of utilities and liberalization of them, starting, of course, in the 1980s, but then continuing into the 90s. And in retail energy in particular, liberalization happened during most of the 90s, where there's opening to competition. So the privatized electricity and gas firms could compete with each other for customers, and also new firms could enter the market. 
um, and you know, try and attract customers themselves. And what we saw over that period, the initial period of competition, was a growth of vertically integrated supply businesses, what became known as the big six. These were initially the, reg the privatized regional electricity monopolies plus British Gas, which was offering to customers both gas and electricity, but also had vertical integration because they also owned generating plants. So things like gas power stations, for instance, in the case of British Gas, of course, a lot of the um, gas infrastructure as well. And so they were big companies across the energy supply chain. And what this caused was what I'm going to dub the first of my at least perceived cane toads, right? Because there were perceived problems into the 2000s of prices being lower outside the home area of the company. So if you're something like Scottish Power, you were setting lower prices for English customers than you were setting for Scottish ones. In this case, maybe 15 or 20% lower prices for, for English customers. Now, again, given the title of these talks, that's a very basic Econ 101 point. When you have two different markets with different price sensitivities, then firms are going to want to set different prices. Customers in Scotland were um, less sensitive to price rises than customers in England, in the case of Scottish Power, so they're setting lower prices to, to customers in England. And this was perceived as a major problem. Ofgem and others did, did a bunch of work on analysing this and trying to deal with it. And what came out of this in broad terms were two, um, two types of interventions. So first, Ofgem introduced what's called retail market reform. And that did a range of things, but it included restrictions on price discrimination. So those sorts of differences in prices between, for instance, Scottish and English customers, they were restricted. You could not offer such a wide range of tariffs. You couldn't discriminate between different customers so much. And alongside this, actually more from the government department, from, from DEC at the time, there was a stimulus to smaller entrants in, in, in practice. So smaller entrants were just paying lower costs and had um, were able to offer lower prices to customers than the bigger firms were. And this is a, yeah, I won't worry too much about the detail here, but this is a breakdown of some of the costs that energy suppliers face. Quite a lot of those costs are essentially just pass-through costs. So there's not much that suppliers can do about them. You might think there's a 200, 220 pounds, that sort of area that suppliers can control. And the smaller suppliers, because of how um, some of these obligations were set up, they were essentially exempt from paying for these obligations, environmental obligations, until they had more than 250,000 customers. They were saving maybe 40 pounds per customer, maybe a bit more. So what this meant is that there was an inbuilt cost advantage for the small suppliers, and so an ability for them to expand as a result. That's, I, I should say, that's one of the factors Another one, which is, yeah, I, I think we found over time is perhaps more important, was that a lot of these new suppliers that came in weren't hedging sufficiently. They weren't hedging against increases in wholesale prices as much as you might want. And you can see this, I'm going to use the phrase Econ 101 quite a bit, as a classic moral hazard problem, whereby the firms were betting that they would win, they'd make nice juicy profits if prices stayed low, but someone else would lose out if they went high because they could just go bankrupt. They often have fairly limited assets. And so if prices increase, then that's, they'd be okay and, and they could walk away. So what happened? Well, this introduced what was seen as at least another perceived cane toad here, another intervention with a bunch of unintended consequences that, that then um, regulators, authorities needed to deal with. Um, and what happened in particular as these smaller suppliers came in was that they could offer significantly lower prices than the existing big suppliers. Um, and partly as a result of that and, and perceived very high prices from those, those traditional big six, you have an investigation by the Competitions and Markets Authority, which published in, in 2016. And that explicitly found, incidentally, that the retail market reforms of a few years earlier had had anti-competitive effects. So the earlier intervention, which were trying to make the market work better, actually was found to have had anti-competitive effects. And you, you can see as part of this, there was a comparison of the lowest prices in the market to the highest ones, and an assumption or claim that customers could gain by paying lower prices overall. 
So a figure that became very important was that uh, a claim that customers on uh, default standard variable tariffs could save 300 pounds or more by switching to a cheaper deal and that customers were paying 1.4 billion pounds a year, big sum of money, more than they would in a, in a fully competitive market. So what came out of that? Well, actually the CMA considered things like a price cap, might seem an obvious uh, possibility if prices are too high, but in its majority report, it stepped back from this. It said, we've thought about price cap, but in fact, what we recommend are interventions to make switching easier, to make information easier for people to access, and so to encourage switching to some of those smaller firms. But that wasn't really enough for politicians. It wasn't seen as perhaps a dramatic and concrete enough intervention. And that there was a minority report by the CMA, which had said, you should be introducing a price cap across the market. And we then had a very tangled history, as I was at Ofgem at the time, a very tangled history of the introduction of the price cap. Because although this had essentially cross-party support, both the Labour and Conservative parties thought a, a price cap would be a good thing, after the 2017 elections, Theresa May was leading a, a minority government. So despite that cross-party support, there were worries that with a very low majority in Parliament, the price cap might get derailed or it might get changed during the parliamentary process. So we then had what for me was amusing, but and perhaps not great, this sort of fairly lengthy and slightly passive aggressive process between the government and Ofgem as the regulator, where the government was saying, well, of course, we could introduce legislation, but we think that maybe you Ofgem might, might be better off doing it instead. You know, we don't want to have to mess around in Parliament. And Ofgem, you know, very politely saying, well, that's a, an interesting suggestion, but in fact, we think that maybe you should introduce legislation that might just be a bit better all round. You're, you're probably the people to make these big decisions. And this sort of ping pong, very polite ping pong on the whole, but ping pong between government and regulator uh, went on for a while. But the upshot of that, which I think in process terms is probably the right thing to come out of that, because it is a big political and policy issue, was that, um, the government did introduce legislation to parliament uh, calling for a price cap to come in as soon as possible um, and in fact that ended up being quite straightforward through parliament it didn't get get changed very significantly during the, the parliamentary process so you know fairly rare occurrence maybe of cross-party support for a major piece of legislation what happened um well actually in the short term not a huge amount i mean you can see um on this blue line here that those expensive prices in the market did fall in the short term, perhaps a hundred pounds reduction in bills for a, a typical consumer. So certainly not nothing, but um, yeah, very not dramatic. Um, and actually one thing that perhaps surprised us a little bit is that you still did have quite a lot of very cheap tariffs on the market. So this is the red line here, where we thought that maybe some of these cheap tariffs would disappear. If you're a small supplier, operating on a tease and squeeze basis, on a basis where you want to get customers through the door and then charge them higher prices later, you might be more reluctant to do that if you know the, the prices are capped and you know you won't be able to charge a particular high price down the line. But in fact, in the short term, we still saw um, very, very low prices in the market and, and quite big gaps between the price cap and the cheapest tariffs available. But in hindsight, of course, and, and for some extent in foresight, this was storing up problems because a lot of these tariffs were just not sustainable if um, if wholesale prices would rise significantly and of course wholesale prices have risen very 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 significantly so what we've seen is that basically those cheap tariffs have just disappeared and all tariffs are essentially converging on the, on the level of the price cap and i think that's something we, we'd expect to see um for at least a while yet is that you won't see many of those cheap tariffs for a while i suspect and of course, I'm sure you'll have seen some of the headlines and some of the discussion around that. That's been accompanied by what I'm going to call another of the cane toes, another of the unintended consequences. I don't think this is really directly linked to the price cap as such. I don't think the price cap has caused companies to go out of business. But it has probably made it harder to reallocate customers of, of failed firms to other, um, other firms because there's perhaps slightly less incentive to take on new customers because you can't charge them quite so much. Um, and so you've seen a fairly rapid reduction in the number of suppliers from around 70 suppliers down towards 40 or so. Uh, 
Now that's not a bad thing in itself. I mean, that's how competition works. Poor companies, not so good companies go out of business, new companies come in, they attract customers. That's basically how these things should work. But it is bad in the way that it happened because the costs that have been associated with those supplier failures have been socialized across customers as a whole. And you can see this effectively, it's a transfer between those people who were paying very low prices, um, the, the very cheap tariffs before, they, they, those were effectively being subsidized by um, the, the, the sort of um, socialization of costs that we're now seeing coming onto energy bills over the next six months or next year or more. So everybody would be paying for those cheaper tariffs that people enjoyed uh, over the last few years. So what's happened more recently? I, I should say this happened after I left off Gem in, in 2020, but there have been some more interventions. Um, in particular, there have been some restrictions on, on entry, um, and there have been interventions to support the financial stability of supply companies. So things like stress tests modeled on the financial sector to try to um, assess the resilience of, of suppliers to, to shocks and to ensure that, you know, that, there's a, that they have at least reasonably strong business models. What will happen next? Who knows? I must admit, I'm slightly tempted to draw this as a circle because I think we might go back to having a smaller number of big companies, at least for a while, and, and that that will be the, the dynamic of the market. But frankly, who knows? You know, I think it, it is a very fluid situation. I would expect more political intervention. So there's, there's perhaps a lot more that could change in the space over the, the coming year or two. So that's a, a whistle-stop tour through what's happened in regulation over the last, last 20 years or so. What would I draw out as, as common themes there? Well, one thing I, I would say as a, a starting point, perhaps I would say this, but I do think regulators are mostly pretty dedicated and pretty skilled professionals, in my experience, who are trying their best to achieve good outcomes for consumers and are doing so in, a, in tricky situations, you know, difficult, very complex ecosystems they're dealing with. And I would say that outcomes overall might be better than they would have been without interventions. I've obviously focused on some of the negatives, some of the unintended consequences here, but there are also lots of positives. Uh, to pick out one of them, the growth of new suppliers such as Octopus, such as Ovo, has, I think, had major positive impacts. And I think it should also increase the ability of the, the energy market to achieve, to achieve net zero and to achieve rapid decarbonisation over time. However, um, I think the core economic arguments for interventions and that understanding of those wider ecosystem effects can be quite limited. And decisions are you know, inevitably, it, given the political salience of energy, are made in, in some kind of a hurry with lots of political pressure and lots of noise around, around what, might go, what might go on. And all of the major interventions have had significant unintended consequences but at least to date, later regulators have felt they needed to deal with, they needed to do something about those, those kind of consequences. What does this all mean? Well, actually a very basic lesson, I suppose. Regulators aren't superheroes. I came to that conclusion that then allowed me to Google some pictures of regulators as superheroes. So you get to see some dodgy PowerPoints uh, pictures next. Um, <clears throat> and this is where I wanted to draw out some of the digital regulation issues. So there's a lot of talk over a long period of time, particularly in Europe, but also in the UK, and since the Biden administration came in in, in the US as well, about establishing strong ex-ante regulation of, of digital firms, particularly what's known as the GAFM, so Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, and, and Microsoft, and, and seeing them as gatekeeper firms with you know, major problems resulting from their activities, which require major interventions. And um, this is Margaret Vesteger, the Commissioner for Competition in, in the EU. Um, and I'm, I'm picking on a, a quote actually from Thierry Breton, who's um, the Commissioner for the Internal Market. But you can see similar quite bold statements about what you can achieve via regulation of digital firms in the US and in the UK as well. Um, so <clears throat> just to kind of read out a bit of this quote, this agreement, the agreement to bring through the Digital Markets Act, seals the economic leg of our ambitious reorganization of our digital space in the internal market. We will quickly work on designating gatekeepers, so those big firms that can control 
Well, the idea is they can control access to customers based on objective criteria. And then through effective enforcement, the new rules will bring increased contestability, fairer conditions for consumers and business users, allowing for more innovation and choice in the market. So I think all good things, of course. And I think just to be clear, I do think there are significant problems in how digital markets work that could in principle justify um, significant, significant interventions. Um, however, I think it is interesting just quite how ambitious the sense of what regulation can achieve is here. And that's one of my worries is that you might, you know, that that's sort of very great ambition to achieve very major things and to deal with all kinds of problems via digital regulation might lead to some of those unintended consequences, some of those cane toads that certainly we're seeing in the energy market. I wanted to contrast with a, you know, a kind of more limited view of, um, of the role of regulation going back almost 40 years now. So this is Stephen Littlechild, who um, was responsible for setting up a lot of the structure post privatization in, in the UK and was a essentially the, the old boss of Ofgem, the energy regulator, where he said regulation is essentially a means of preventing the worst excesses of monopoly. It's not a substitute for competition. It's a means of holding the fort until the competition arrives. Now, I think in practice, actually, the scope to introduce competition, certainly in some things like energy networks, hasn't been as great as maybe was expected 40 years ago. But I do think that philosophy in general is very different. It's a philosophy about trying to target the really major problems rather than thinking you can, you can solve everything that comes along. And I, I must admit, and perhaps my presentation of this would suggest this, that you know, I'm probably um, philosophically more in tune with that. Okay, let's let's really target the big stuff with regulatory interventions, and let's not try to, you know, that trying to solve everything might cause more harm than good. But that's um, jumping ahead, I guess, to my summary here. So overall, I think intervening in ecosystems is really hard, and I don't want at all to. Kind of belittle the efforts of my, my former colleagues at Ofgem, where you know, I think it is very difficult things they are doing and definitely trying their best to do uh, to achieve them and overall you know, with, with some notable successes. But with that, I think also examples of negative consequences of those interventions. And what would I take from that? Well, I think that if you can't explain why you're intervening in Econ 101 terms, you probably shouldn't be. I think there are Clearly, some cases where you want to use more complex theories of harm, to use a jargon where you want to think in more about and more complex ideas. But actually, in general, the most important issues tend to be those very basic issues from, from for instance, first year economics, things like natural monopoly, for instance, in the in the energy sector, where you think this is a, 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 there's a major case for intervention here. And there's a quote which I trace back or the earliest quote I could find is back to the 1951 Alice in Wonderland film, um, spoken fairly contradictorily by the White Rabbit, which is don't just do something, stand there. There is, I think, especially when you have lots of political noise, where you have lots of um, push to, to intervene, there is benefit in saying, well, sometimes you need to just step back and, and let things play out, let market dynamics play out before, um, before intervening or rather than intervening. Um, <clears throat> and I suppose connected to that, I think more regulatory humility is important, but there are processes that you can set up that will structure that, that will make sure that you bring evidence forward when you're making interventions, even in perhaps quite you know, high temperature political debates. And so things like experimentation and in introducing new regulations, one of the things that I was proudest of in my time in Ofgem was leading the, the team that um, carried out experiments on the impact of, of new approaches to retail markets, the impacts of things to encourage switching, for instance, um, and you know, other regulators, the Financial Conduct Authority, Ofcom have also used that kind of experimental approach to try to work out what sort of effects a, a, an intervention will have. <clears throat> Internal challenge mechanisms and external accountability. I was at the National Audit Office before. Clearly, there's there's benefits in having those sorts of structures that are are watching out for how well regulators are doing and how well competition authorities are too. A point that I think gets discussed a bit less though is about appeal rights. So so clearly, it's important that 
GAFAM, for instance, they have the ability to appeal against interventions that might affect them, of course. You know, and hey, the firm I work for now makes a chunk of its money from those kind of appeals. So, hey, perhaps I would say that. But I, I, I use the phrase balanced as well, because I do think there is an issue in ensuring that smaller companies, entrants, for instance, can also appeal against, um, against interventions or can appeal for interventions which are more dramatic. You know, actually might say we need to do more to deal with the gap ends and also for consumer groups to appeal on regulatory matters one of the things when i was off gen we always kind of wanted was an appeal by citizens advice because that would put more pressure on on us on the whole system to say well actually consumers uh, voices really matter here too and um, that's much easier said than done i should say and it's not there is of course a wider access to justice issue where you you want people who don't have deep pockets to be able to access justice. And, and you know, there, there are kind of wider questions about how you achieve that. I'm not saying I have great answers there. Um, greater use of ex post evaluations. So I think the Competition and Markets Authority, they in fact published an evaluation just today of some of their mergers. I think they have led, along with the Dutch Authority, some of the uh, evaluation work. But I think there is more that can be done in, um, in evaluating how well interventions have worked that ability to take a step back and to think about when you're making decisions in the heat of, heat of the moment, what sort of effects do they have, I think is very important. And also finally, things like sunset clauses. I think if you have a regulation that, that will expire in five, 10 years, whatever it might be, that ability then to take a step back and say, well, actually, what do we need it for? Why are we doing this? What, what's the, the fundamental core, as I say, Econ 101 motivation for this, um, for this intervention, I think is, is very important. Um, so I'll wrap up there. I hope there's, there's lots to discuss off the back of that. Uh, as I say, some of that is a um, whistle-stop tour. I, um, I can't quite resist flashing up another uh, cane toad. So thanks very much. Uh, thank you uh, so much, Joe, for that kind of tour of the kind of the energy market and some of the economic principles that we should be thinking about when it comes to regulation. Um, so everyone, please put your questions um, in the chat. Um, I've got some of my own. But I'm actually going to go to a question um, from the chat first, um, just because it links in so nicely to how you were concluding. Um, so you know, you, you were talking a lot really about, I guess it was more kind of an experimental data-driven um, kind of in, in, in economics, like kind of recently with like Esther Duflow, you would think about it more as like an engineering or kind of type approach to thinking about uh, fixing some of these problems and not necessarily tackling the whole system at once. Um, so what, what the question is, is um, so, you know, it, this gets brought up a lot, this need for experimentation and more kind of data driven, I would say, policy making across a lot of different angles, across a lot of different areas. So why do you think we don't see more of it um, in energy? Um, and given like kind of your experience um, in policy um, and now in your in your current job, um, like what, what do you think that we could do to be encouraging more experimentation when it comes to policy in this area? Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question, which I have thought about quite a bit, having, having led some of those experiments in the past. And I, I think part of the dynamic, to be frank, is that actually experiments, of, you mentioned Esther did flow, are possibly easier in the development context than they are in the developed world context, right? Which feels counterintuitive, right? You've got the resources to commit to the to experiments in when you're um, in a developed country, you've got maybe some of the infrastructure that makes carrying out those experiments easier. But in practice, actually, the um, in development economics, you have a big advantage that actually you are giving the money to, it, it, you know, it is richer countries giving money to poor countries and be able to say as part of that, well, we want to experiment, we want to kind of test out what works and what doesn't. In a developed country context, and this is certainly the case in energy, there's often a lot of um, political heat around an issue that makes it quite difficult to say, as I sometimes tried and sometimes succeeded to, okay, yeah, that's, that sounds like an interesting idea, but let's just stop a moment and work out whether it actually works or not. That can be, in some contexts, you can do it. If it's something which you know, is maybe not right top of the political agenda, you can do it. But in general, being able to to say, great, that sounds a good idea, but it might be two years before you actually know whether it works or not, it's quite difficult. And I think that, that for me is a fundamental dynamic. There are, there are certainly other issues there. There's some issues about capacity, 
there are some issues just about actually do regulators have the power to make to do those kind of experiments and uh, you know those are in principle coming through for the competition and markets authority and for the digital markets unit in the uk um but you know there's also just that interaction with the political will which i think is is very important so um if maybe i shouldn't say if you were still chief economist at Ofgem, but if you were, if you were <laughs> and i guess kind of kind of uh Rishi's eye or people who are kind of making policy kind of um, at the moment and um, what so my understanding of what you said is that you wouldn't necessarily at this time given what's causing some of the price um, increases and also this need for experimentation you would be potentially anyways, what would you be advocating for for him to be what, what, what would you be advocating for in terms of the policy space uh, at, at this time yeah it's a a very flippant answer is to say resign, right? It's a it's a it's a very difficult job, and I don't I don't envy the people who've had it. I've, I've been in situ not as nowhere near as severe actually as the kind of crisis that's seen now, but situations where there has been some of that crisis, and it's it's uncomfortable, right? It's interesting, it's high impact, but it is also uncomfortable, and um, so that's the flippant answer. I think the I think there is a as perhaps my initial slide suggested, there is a a, a kind of almost a disaster management element to this, right? I think the the impact of the price rises, the scale of the price rises we've seen, will cause very, very significant hardship. And I think the first objective of government in that context has to be reducing that hardship, right? There's all sorts of great, potentially great, at least long-term things you can do about building new nuclear power stations, um, you know, improving insulation, all sorts of good things like that. I think it was a on insulation in particular, I think it has been a missed opportunity for quite a while, not, not investing in that. But actually at the moment, we're in more of a crisis situation, I think, and, and the first thing you need to do is to deal with that crisis and deal with the hardship that results from it, which frankly, I think probably does need quite a lot of fiscal support. Probably targeted fiscal support, but probably needs quite a lot of fiscal support to, to happen. Um, yeah, then there is, you know, as I, as I say, there's, there's sort of much more longer term things you can do as well, which, I, I don't, I wouldn't claim to have any great insights beyond what other people are discussing there. One thing I was quite struck by um, in the graphs that you were showing was this kind of moral hazard component to some of it felt like the pricing decisions of new entrants into the market. And I was just wondering a little bit more how we think about the role of competition then in terms of you, kind of if you like kind of resolving res resolving those issues or can you, can you maybe tell us a little bit more about actually what you would think of in terms of the principles for regulation there uh, in terms of balancing competition but then you've got a funny selection basically of new entrants into the market um what, what would be the things to look at to limit that yeah so i think to just to kind of explain what i at least see as the issue so Essentially, you've got or you, you had historically a bunch of firms entering the market that weren't particularly hedged against wholesale price rises. So that meant that if, if wholesale prices were to rise a lot, they would essentially become insolvent. And that's indeed what happened, right? And in the quite rightly, the GB energy market, like other energy markets, has provisions to um, ensure that there's continuity of supply. So ensure that if your supplier ha has gone bankrupt, you're still going to be able to have gas and heat, uh, um, lighting and heating. Um, again, absolutely rightly that that's, that's the case. Um, it also has provisions that mean that if you've got some money with a energy firm and it goes bankrupt, you will get that money back. Again, there's probably pretty good reasons for that. But what all of that means is that there's not very much incentive for a consumer to think, hang on, I, I, I shouldn't go with, you know, scamyourenergybill.com. I should go with British Gas or something like that, right? You know, there isn't that kind of incentive that, or historically there wasn't that kind of incentive to, to kind of think about who you are buying with. So in that setting, you know, it is a very classic moral hazard problem. Your question then is what can, how can you kind of make competition work in that setting? And the, and the route that Ofgem is certainly going down now is more of a financial market setting, right? In financial markets, we've decided that 
consumers can't reasonably be expected to exercise due diligence. Small consumers can't be expected to exercise due diligence. So you have regulators that are there to, in quite a sort of intensive way, to test the system implications of a failure, to test the robustness of the, the different firms in the financial sector. And that's, as I say, is, is broadly the route that the energy sector is going. There are other proposals that might say, well, you could put something, you could put some skin in the game on consumers. You could say that consumers have to, um, you know, will lose some money if their supplier goes out of business. You won't protect all of the credit balances. In principle, there is an argument for that, frankly. You know, as, as I said, what's, what's in, in practice happened is that the people who switched have been subsidized a lot by all consumers. Is that right? Well, probably not, actually. So there is in principle an argument, but I think it is quite difficult, especially given that expectation, it is quite difficult to change that now. It is also very difficult for, you know, how, I, I've been working in this for, for quite a while. I, I, how, how confident am I that I could recognize a slightly dodgy supplier or not kind of completely, um, uh, kind of perfectly hedged supplier versus a one that is not particularly confident, right? So, sorry, I, I'm, I'm sort of, waffling a bit there but I, I think there are sort of trade-offs there Ofgem has probably gone quite a bit towards the right we're going to just make sure that firms in the, in the market are stable yeah no because so i've done some work on switching in health insurance markets and i think they're very similar in terms of the kind of inertia on the consumer side dynamics and as you say, it's kind of tricky because you, you know, in order to, if you like, encourage competition and get to in an economic sense, how we think about, you know, a more kind of first best type market, you want consumers switching around quite a lot, but then there are information problems everywhere. There's behavioral problems added into that. So the idea of potentially placing kind of people at like potentially quite more significant risks of switching if they get it wrong it's it is exceptionally complicated um there's um, a couple of questions um which i'm going to kind of put together about um i guess it's more about kind of uh, thinking about dealing with i guess the current situation we're in so um and uh, around energy storage so um hugh morris has asked kind of do you think that more incentives are needed to encourage greater storage of electricity um and um Louise has also asked about um, your opinions about hybrid systems that also encourage um, using energy from kind of more off-grid mechanisms. Mm. Yeah, so I think I think there's the, the storage is a is a um, kind of very interesting question. I think because you know, we have over time actually some of the storage was in gas, right? And you know if you if you have a largely gas-fired system then actually you may not store electricity particularly, but you will store gas and then you've got a kind of reserve you can tap into. And over time, Britain's actually reduced some of that, that storage of gas. So it's potentially, you could argue, reduced at least some of its um, security to events like the, the war in Ukraine. Um, I think So in principle, I think there is quite a strong argument to, to be frank about having more storage in the system. I think in the current crisis, the realistic scale of that is nowhere near enough, right? So even if you'd really targeted storage over the last decade, then it would have been not quite a drop in the ocean, but it would have been fairly marginal compared to those huge increases in, in prices we've seen. So it could somewhat moderate that. And you've seen with things like the strategic reserves that the US has, you've seen some moderation in prices there, but it's not gonna uh, solve the world or, or you know, change things very profoundly. The, I think there are longer term hopes. I think everybody's car in the not too distant future will be an electricity storage um, mechanism, right? So there's a lot of potential in the future to use that actively to store energy, right? But it, it's, it's probably not a short term answer in quite the same way. Um, the off grid question, I'm not quite sure. Um, where that comes from is that is that off grid as a as improving the working of the system or is is the i'm not sure um it's um that that was that was uh that was the um uh kind of what what is what is in the, that's the information i have in the chat um sorry yeah i'm just seeing the question actually now so hi louise i'm, I'm sorry if i don't get this exactly right please do come back in 
the um uh, so you you have seen increasingly less so in, in gb actually but people going off grid particularly around the um increasing availability of solar so this has happened in spain right you just go off the um off the energy network you have solar plus storage and you use that for your electricity needs right this is this is possible i think and, and maybe I'm, I'm saying this from a perspective of a major regulator from someone who maybe likes big systems but i do think that perhaps raises more problems than it solves right i think those sorts of off-grid options are most feasible for wealthier consumers you know people who have a chunk of land for instance that they can um they can have solar they can have batteries and that's good for them but it does potentially cause risks for other people for people who might be left with the legacy system and paying for the legacy system without those kind of options so I, i'm unconvinced that those kind of off-grid mechanisms themselves can make too much difference but i recognize i might have slightly misunderstood the question so so louise please come back in if you, if you have more things there the kind of the point about solar so how what's your opinion about the lessons from what we're seeing now for the green transition um and are there any policies that you would be you know in terms of on the experiment on the experimentation list that you know particularly you know given the net given kind of net zero commitments and does that i mean my naive thought would be that would imply an increase in energy prices <laughs> at some point um yeah i i think so i do think big picture the position of europe in general and actually within that the uk in particular some of the nordics even more so has been fantastic right we've seen a real transformation in energy systems over the last 30 years and essentially all of the decarbonization or the vast majority of the decarbonization we're seeing in the uk has come from the electricity system in particular but also to some extent the reduction in the use of gas in, in, in um, for domestic use. And that's really impressive, right? That there's been very significant gains there. So partly I'll say, actually carry on, right? That, that it's not, it actually has been quite impressive already. I think the, the types of policies you might want to think about and need to bring forward actually relates to the question earlier, which is around things like storage. How can you have the right level of flexibility in a system which is um, predominantly driven by intermittent generation. So it's predominantly driven by solar, by wind. So you haven't got big coal-fired, big gas-fired power stations that you can just switch on and off you know, broadly at, at the moment. You're reliant upon when the wind blows, when, so when the sun shines. And having enough flexibility to, um, uh, to kind of manage that, I think is, is one of the big policy questions over the next 10, 20 years. And that's something that is very open to experimentation. You know, I think there are different approaches. We will need domestic consumers to take different approaches to managing their energy use, to being a bit more flexible, for instance, you know, heating their homes at night rather than, you know, having a kind of just have, being used to switching on a boiler when you come home from work or whatever. You know, there are changes in behavior needed there. And um, that is the type of policy that's very open to experimentation and very in principle, you can get real benefits from experimentation. Um, so, oh, one minute, there is... Um, so I'll just, and then I'll finish with my final question. So, the, so uh, Sheila has asked, um, uh, could you expand on the impact that the war can have on countries attempting to find uh, kind of solutions to energy for all? Um, and what do you think kind of wealthy countries can do to assist kind of the um, kind of less developed world with their energy needs um, and to what extent to just kind of like link to uh, democratization? Yeah, I, I think it's so both very good questions. I'll, I'll see how I answer them. The, um, the war, yeah, I, I think there are risks around the war and around geopolitical developments in general, which are autarky risks, right? Around mm -hmm. countries deciding actually we can't rely upon things like interconnectors to Europe, in the case of UK, we need to be able to go it alone. And I think that is, you know, it's an understandable reaction to these kind of geopolitical developments. It would be, a, from my perspective, a pretty sad reaction and a pretty negative reaction mm. in general. You know, I'm not saying 
obviously we should be buying less Russian gas and, and Russian oil. But the you know the, the, the sort of potential split between countries and moving towards more autarkic system, I think, is potentially problematic. Um, so I think that's yeah, you know, that's essentially a diplomatic um, uh, kind of question rather than a necessarily an economic or regulatory type question. But I do think there's there's some points there around, okay, can we show the benefits of international links? So there's discussion in my area about North Sea grid. So bringing forward offshore wind farms in the North Sea that can, sometimes they'll, they'll serve GB, sometimes they'll serve Denmark, sometimes they'll serve the Netherlands, Germany, you know, they may go in multiple different directions. That in principle is a really beneficial development that could have very profound impacts and could also show the benefits of some of that international cooperation. But, you know, we'll see how, how the, the um, diplomacy plays out with that. Um, in terms of the assisting the underdeveloped world with energy needs, I think there has been lots of investment. Again, I think GB has done pretty well here in things like promoting wind farms, promoting solar farms. I, I, in my previous job, I um, uh, kind of looked at some projects that the UK had been supporting in, in sub-Saharan Africa, which are you know, both low carbon and also um, uh, potentially really reducing the price, reducing the price of energy, allowing not necessarily development of democracy, but certainly allowing industrial development in, in that context. Um, I would broadly say more of that there is there is a question within that about you know, can you do more to um, to prevent the outsourcing of carbon? I think one of the developments we have seen, which is slightly dodgy in my view, is where Britain can say, "Hey, we are cutting our carbon emissions. We're doing great. Everyone else should follow us. We're wonderful." And what it's really doing is importing a lot of carbon from other countries or at least part of what it's doing is importing carbon from other countries because it's importing goods which use high carbon production, maybe even oil via power station production in, in other countries. So, and certainly maybe coal as well via production in other countries. And so I think there is that kind of risk about, or there's a need, I think, for developed countries to be honest about their, the carbon impacts of the decisions that they're making. No, absolutely. I think it'll be quite interesting seeing how some of the kind of EU border tax um, policy type kind of, the, you know, the, how, how that will play into into this. Um, so I guess my again, last question, we've got just two minutes left is, um, I guess some of the, uh, one thing I've been a bit struck by with uh, kind of the current crisis is, you know, this asymmetry between kind of, you know, the on the consumer side, the impact of rising prices, especially hitting poorer households. But then if you look at the kind of the uh, kind of profits, of course, that some of on, in the whole on the wholesale side that are being posted. Um, and I was just wondering kind of if you could have some reflections on that and what kind of policy measures you might think, you know, will we see a windfall tax on that? Will we see kind of, uh, yeah, what would, what would, is there anything you could, you know, you, you would uh, kind of any thoughts on that about what we might see politics wise? Yeah, so I, I think there is a kind of legitimate fear, I think, about things like windfall taxes as reducing investment, right? So there is a fear that you, okay, if you introduce a windfall tax, then people won't invest, for instance, in low carbon generation, because they think that if they make profits in future, those will be taxed away. Um, I think to be, as a personal view, I should say, in the context of the price rises we've seen and the profit rises we've seen, those fears are a bit overblown. I think you can make a generalizable principle that says, in general, we're very happy with companies making profits, but when those profits become very high for reasons which are essentially completely outside their control, then we will have at least some windfall taxation on those. I think there's a, a pretty strong principle there. I, I would say that the, the political debate that links windfall taxation and what you do about energy prices doesn't necessarily make sense to me. Right? Yeah. You, you might think windfall tax is a good way to raise money. I kind of do. You might also think there should be interventions to help poor consumers. I definitely do. The There is no less necessary link between those two. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Joe. That was um, really fascinating. And I'm not sure I'll look at toads. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you uh, so much for all your questions um, and engagement. Um, the um, sign up for the next uh, lecture um, is in the um, is in the chat. Um, and so looking forward to seeing everyone next month. And yeah, Joe, thank you again. Fantastic. Thanks very much, all. Bye.